We get a lot of questions about disinfection byproducts in drinking water. There's a lot of confusion and unknowns about the issue, so in this video we'll answer the most frequently asked questions. Question 1. What are disinfection byproducts? Water disinfection is the main reason why waterborne illnesses are not a more serious threat in the United States. However, chlorine-based disinfectants can have unintended consequences. One is they can react with other things found in tap water, such as organic matter, and form a class of halogenated chemicals known as disinfection byproducts. Disinfection byproducts are generally regarded as an emerging contaminant because despite having identified more than 600 different disinfection byproducts, roughly 50% are still unaccounted for. Many DBPs are known carcinogens in humans, so they rightfully receive quite a bit of scrutiny when found in tap water. While some disinfection byproducts have almost no toxicity, others have been associated with cancer, reproductive problems, and development issues in laboratory animals. Some studies have also found an association between chlorinated tap water and those same problems in humans. Because more than 200 million people in the U.S. use chlorinated tap water as a primary drinking source, it's something worth taking a very close look at. Question two, how are DBPs regulated? Regulation is complicated. It's a tough situation because thorough water disinfection is critical to preventing waterborne illness, but disinfection practices also lead to the formation of disinfection byproducts. Policymakers are trying to balance the risks of long-term chemical exposure to disinfection byproducts with the immediate effects of waterborne illness. From a toxicology standpoint, this is nearly impossible to do because the identity of so many disinfection byproducts are unknown, let alone the toxicity of these chemicals. From a public health standpoint, regulation is difficult because long-term effects are not well quantified in humans. And, as with other regulations, the benefit of fixing the issue is balanced with the cost of fixing the problem and the willingness of the public to pay the increased costs. This means that regulatory agencies have to take into account that smaller municipalities typically don't have the resources to actually comply with new regulations, particularly when the benefits are not well quantified. It's an extremely difficult balancing act, and the path of least resistance often wins unless the problem is causing immediate disaster, and even then, it takes years to acknowledge that a problem exists. Question 3. How do I know if my water has high levels of DBPs? Overall, disinfection byproduct concentrations are difficult to predict because many factors influence their formation, including concentration of organic matter, chemical composition of the precursor materials, pH, temperature, type of disinfectant used, and the concentration of disinfectant. However, because of EPA mandates, Monitoring these chemicals, the average concentrations found in water supply must be made available by the public in annual drinking water reports. The location of your home can impact your levels of DBPs. This is because the longer it takes the water to reach the home, the more opportunity there is for a disinfection byproducts to form. So locations close to fast flowing water mains often have lower levels of DBPs than homes found at the periphery and low flow areas of the water distribution network. Additionally, DBP concentrations can continue to rise in residential pipes and water tanks if the water remains stagnant for extended periods of time, like the workday or overnight. In fact, most municipalities recommend letting water run for 1 to 10 minutes before using it for drinking or cooking so pipes can flush out. But obviously no one's doing that. Question 4. How are people exposed to DBPs? Most people use chlorinated tap water to drink, bathe, wash dishes, etc. A few studies have looked at the various means of exposure and found that showering contributed heavily to blood levels of trihalomethanes. While this may sound surprising, it does make sense because trihalomethanes can be volatilized in hot water and then inhaled. Also during a shower, DBPs can be absorbed into the body by the skin. Because most people come in contact with over 17 gallons of water in an average eight minute shower, but drink less than half a gallon of water each day, it makes sense that showering can be a major source of exposure. And question five, how do I remove DBPs from my home's water? 
Clearly the solution is not to stop showering. That'd be bad. The most effective way for people to reduce the exposure today is by filtering their water at the point of use, like an undersink or a shower filter. While regulatory agencies and municipalities are taking steps toward reducing disinfection byproducts by preoxidizing or filtering out organic precursors, using a proper filter is the most effective solution in the meantime. The same goes for drinking. Boiling your water does not remove DBPs, nor do most common pitcher and fridge filters. You need a filter with specialized technology. If you have any questions about DBPs in your water or want a filter that is optimized to remove them, please drop us an email at hello at hydrovive.com or visit hydrovive.com and use our live chat feature. Our Washington DC based water nerds will help you make sense of the complexities surrounding your home's water.